try to kind of gather what would the audience care about. So I picked a few topics that seem to me uh, like something that is both in the realm of science, but also has applications that are right now new enough so people in the audience who care about business might pick it up and think of things that you can do with it. So what I did is I collected a bunch of new things in science, studies from the last two to five years, that actually are mature enough for you to care about. I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of them in the next 10 minutes and kind of entice your ideas to think about what can you do in the future. So here's four things that are new in science. First thing that is kind of new in science that is really changing the world of a uh, neuroscientist is the view of memory. So for the last uh, many centuries, in the last five centuries, memory has been studied by many neuroscientists. And what they all arrived at is that memory is kind of like a hard drive. They imagine that memory is sitting there in your brain and you have a thought, the thought gets into your brain, you store it there and it's there forever. And maybe if you don't pay attention, it's stored uh, uh, less uh, strong, but you get it to know all the, all the time. So you can imagine yourself going to a party you go to a party, you meet someone, you shake their hand, they say the name, you tell them their name, you walk away, and a second later, you have no idea what the name is. It's not that your memory didn't work. It's not that you forgot the name because your memory is unable to study and, and contain a name or one word for 10 seconds. The reality is that you never stole it. You never actually put the effort to register the information that came to your mind and put it there. So this is not memory. Memory actually is a system that allows you to get information and store it there forever, at least. And what I mean by that is that memories are always there. They always get kind of engraved by more and more content, but they're always there. At some point, you can actually retrieve things that happened to you when you were a four-year-old, six-year-old, two-year-old, and so on. But here's the thing that is recently known. We think of memory as a little hard drive. We take information, we store it there, and it's there the same way it is. And the reality is that in the last five years, we learned something interesting. We learned that memories are just like a little piece of information like, like, like that's always changing. It's like a little bit of clay. Every time you use memories, they change a little bit. And here's the, the, the image you should have in mind. If I ask you right now, how was yesterday? How was the experience of the day yesterday? What you do is you go to your bank in your brain and you pick a memory that sits there from your experience last night. You pick it up and you start exploring it. And you say, oh, it was great. We had an inception. There was a party. I went to a talk. And as you do that, as you collect information from the past, you don't just re retrieve it and report it. You actually change it. At the moment you take about information and you can experience that, you also use the present information, the thing you're experiencing right now, to change things, and then you store it again with the experience of the moment. So if you're sad right now when I ask you about the past, you're going to store it again with a little bit of a different experience. And here's the best image I have of that. When I was 18, I was a soldier in the Israeli army. And we made about $100 a month, as soldiers do, which doesn't give you a lot of uh, leisure to do stuff. And we just collected the money. At some point, after, a few years in the, after two years in the, in the army, one of my best friends told me, you know what, we make some money, we don't really spend it on anything. How about we go and we spend it on the most fancy restaurant in Tel Aviv? There was a restaurant somewhere in the south of Tel Aviv where a steak would be $500, and we, we felt this could be the best thing. We're going to go, we take all the money that we kind of saved, and we're going to spend it on a really fancy dinner in Tel Aviv. So we took the money, and we called the restaurant and made a reservation for lunch, which was a little bit cheaper. And then we looked at the menu and we realized that what actually makes it expensive is not the, dinner, the lunch itself, but the wine. If you go for the, for the restaurant and you just have regular lunch, you, the, the steak is a little expensive, the dessert is a little expensive, but altogether, what makes it really expensive is the wine. So my friend had, the, had this idea. He said, we're going to go to the restaurant and we're going to bring our own bottle of wine. So we're going to keep the price the way it is and we're going to just spend money from, from our you know, on a little cheap bottle of wine. We get to the restaurant, and as we sat down, the waiter told us there's a problem. If you bought wine, you have to pay a couple of hundred dollars corkage fee. So if you just want to use your own wine, you still have to pay this much money. So we were nervous. We didn't plan for that. And my friend, who was a bit of a criminal, said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put the bottle back in the bag, and every time the waiter goes away, we're going to sip a little bit of our own wine and drink it really fast. So we're not going to pay for that. So the bottle is hidden in the bag, and every time the waiter goes away, we open the bottle, we pour some little wine, we drink it, and then we kind of sip it quickly and we hide the, 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 the glasses and we keep eating without paying the cork hedge fee. This went on for a few uh, uh, hours and I just got the signal to speak slower. So uh, you're going to have to maybe endure me for 12 minutes rather than 10 minutes. <laughs> so we, we have this thing, no one catches us, everything's okay, we leave the restaurant and now we have a great story. 
we had this experience where we went and we, we went to a regular uh, expensive restaurant without paying for the wine. And I, while I was very nervous the entire time when we were there, I was pretty proud of this story when we left. So I kept telling people this story for years. For years, people asked me about experiences in my life. I said, I said that one time when I was 17, or sorry, when I was 19, I went to a restaurant and I didn't pay for the wine and I kind of drank by myself. Everything was great. I told this story for 12 years. Last year, I'm sitting in New York. This same friend who, became, who, stayed, who stayed my friend for all this time comes to visit New York and we sit there and we are among a lot of people and they ask us, where did you meet? And we tell them that we met in the army. And I immediately say, oh, and I have a story about this guy, Jonathan, and how we did things. And I tell the story. And among 20 people, I tell the story of how Jonathan brought this bottle of wine to the restaurant, pulled the glasses. I was pretty nervous about that, but it all worked out. And I tell the story. And then Jonathan says something really surprising. He said, this is a great story. I, 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 I'm an incredible story. The only thing is, it was you who bought the wine. It was you who opened it. I was against that. I was nervous about that. And if you think about our characters, it makes much more sense that it would be me who did that. The one with the criminal mind would be probably me. The reality is that I remember this story clearly as if it was him. And we don't know what's to do anymore, because I told the story so many times with him being in mind that by now, the memory in my brain changed such, in such a way that I actually remember that in, 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 as if it's him. And it happens to us all the time. We change the past by changing the memories and making them better or worse as we go, as we go about life. Going to therapy is in many ways that. You go and you talk about things again and again, and the therapist makes you tell the story, and as you retrieve the story, they change a little bit the experience, and then you save it again with a better version. And when you retrieve it the day after, it gets saved, it gets retrieved with a little better experience. And over time, we can actually change that. So here is one world of interesting phenomena. We now know that memories change, and we know that coming in the right way can change memories for the better. And here's a way for you to think of products that actually benefit for that. And I'm going to give you an idea for one of those things. So here's another world where uh, using that thing is actually influential. There is one moment in your life where you're, you're the most vulnerable. That's the moment where you kind of trying to fight as little as possible. Things come out from the outside and you actually give in to a lot of things and that's the moment we can actually change things. And that's when you're asleep. When you're asleep, your brain is basically shut down. All it does is maintenance and you're very susceptible to information from the outside, that's the moment where people can actually change a lot of you. So now we have studies that try to understand what dreams are for, and specifically change things while you're dreaming. So there's no answer to what dreams are for. There's actually four leading theories right now that kind of try to suggest what, is dream, what are dreams for. There's the old Freudian one that says that dreams are, uh, you know, you, you basically all of your day, you want to sleep with your mom and kill your dad. And then you suppress this thought, you go to sleep, and when you're asleep, all those uh, horrible thoughts come to mind and you see those images of yourself. That's theory number one from about 100 years ago. Theory number two suggests that dreams are actually just uh, memories flowing from one place to the another. It's kind of like a, your brain is defragmenting itself. Your brain is organizing things, things move from one place to the other, and you see those visuals in front of your eyes, and you make it a story. Theory number three is actually the worst one, because it says that dreams don't exist. There's one uh, study that actually says that we, we never dream, we only wake up, and whatever was in our mind as we woke up, we make it into a story. The, the, the only experiment that actually supports this thing is an experiment where people were asked to go to sleep, and at some point while they were dreaming, and we can actually know now exactly when you're dreaming, someone banged the symbols in their ears. So you sit there, you're sleeping, and someone bangs the symbol right away and hides them. So you wake up, and then someone asks you quickly, tell me what you did dream of. And you say, well, I was walking in the street, and then I heard an explosion. So far, a perfect story. But then you say, and I looked to my left, and I saw a building, and the building collapsed. So I ran to the building, and I saved the little baby, and I came outside, and then I saw that there was a puppy, and I came and saved the puppy. And you basically tell an entire story that starts with the explosion and goes on and on, which suggests that maybe you never dreamt of any of that. You just woke up with a sound of an explosion, and you came up with an entire story to justify this thing. This is a terrible one because it, makes, it means that dreams actually don't exist. It's actually very, very unlikely, but just keep that in mind. And the fourth theory, which is my, my favorite one, is, is the following. It says the dreams are you simulating the future. So you have a thought, like you say, should I date this guy or not? Should I take this job or not? Should I leave him or not? Should I actually fly to this place or stay here? You have those thoughts in your mind and you're confused by them. You go to sleep and then your brain basically starts to create stories with you experiencing those things. And you kind of move forward with dating the guy, you move forward with not. You move forward with flying to Rome, you move with flying to Paris. You move with all kinds of scenes, you see how the world would look when you go to them, and then you wake up with the answer. This means that dreams are actually a key moment in our life in making choices. And if we know that, we can now manipulate your choices by injecting things in your dream. Injecting things would be, for instance, somehow playing some sounds while you're dreaming to navigate your answers one way or the other. So now you can think of products that sit next to your bed, 
They have maybe a little EG on your forehead, and they measure when you are in this dream stage. And when you get to the dream stage, they know that now you're actually simulating futures, and now is the time to maybe spray some smell on you and make you think, uh, think one thing or the other, or maybe play some sound. The key example would be uh, we know now that some smells, if you spray them on the brain while you're in a dream stage, you actually change the course or the valence of the dream. So the example would be you're sleeping, you're dreaming right now, and I spray the smell of roses in your nose. If I wake you up right away and I say, what did you dream of? You don't say that you dream of roses, but you definitely say that you had a positive dream. So somehow roses make your dreams be positive. And if I try the opposite and I spray the smell of rotten eggs in your nose, when you're dreaming, you wake up and you say, I had an awful dream. I was uh, drowning in the sea or I was going through something else. So we can basically change the valence, the, the attitude, the, the affect of the dream just by spraying different smells on you. We have to know when you're dreaming. We have to know what you're dreaming of, kind of, like what is the key idea, and then spray it in the right moment to change your thing. So now you can think of products, things that are actually going to take people and help them change the course of their decisions by using this thing that is pretty useful but not really used. So dreams is we sleep for about a third of our life, a lot of time. And right now, it's used for nothing. We just go there and we close our eyes and we wait and wake up in the morning. We don't use it for anything. Maybe we do maintenance, but we don't really use it ourselves. What if we could use that thing to make better choices or to navigate things in a better way? Here's my number three. Number three is in a different realm. It's in the realm of health. So health runs on a spectrum. Mostly, you know about health when you get sick. You get sick, you go to the doctor, the doctor says, looks at you and he says, well, you're sneezing, you have a high fever, uh, you have a, uh, your temperature is high, you may be coughing. Uh, we look at your body and we see that this is not right and we're going to give you medicine, it's going to fix this and that symptom. Hopefully, it's going to make you better. This is one extreme type of medicine. The other extreme is prevention. We tell you if you eat vegetables and if you run every day and if you exercise and if you're trying to not smoke and not uh, drink too much and all of those things, you're going to not actually experience any of the bad things. So this is an extreme thing. You don't have anything right now. You just live life in a way that prevents you even having any things. What about the in-between? What if we could catch the disease when it's kind of starting to happen? And as it becomes a disease, it's not, you're not sick yet, but you kind of start to develop this thing, we're going to stop you. Here's how it's going to go. In our body, we get sick all the time. As we speak right now, each of you is getting sick. You're all getting cancer. You're all getting some colon, di colon disease, you're all getting all kinds of things, but your body is really good in dealing with that. You're getting the disease, your body immediately sends signals and takes care of that. So you never get all the way to being unhealthy. You just stop it right there. A disease is a malfunction of those systems when you actually don't stop this thing and it goes all the way. But what if you put some sensors in your body that identify the changes that are leading to a disease? You can think of that as the like next version of quantified self. You all have watches that uh, measure your steps or something that measures your temperature. We all know that, but right now it's external and it's basically uh, reporting. It just tells you what's going on. What if we both learn about what's going on in your body and also use that to help you? So you imagine a watch sitting in your body and you kind of take a drop of blood every day. It measures your proteins in your body and it tells you, here's what's happening. To yesterday you had this X amount of proteins. Today you have a little more of that protein and it's actually doing something, something that's triggering a disease. You're going to be sick in one week, here's what you should do right now. Tomorrow, you should sleep for at least seven hours. Then you should have tomatoes and vegetables. And then you should have uh, two hours of rest again. And then you should go do that. So basically, we're going to have a, a watch that doesn't just report what's going on with us, but actually looks at us and says, OK, you're getting sick. You should do these five things to get better. This field, proteomics, using proteins to actually develop uh, mechanisms, is the next step of quantified itself. You give a drop of blood, and now you get better before you get sick. If you only listen to your watch, who tells you exactly what to do. This is field number three. And field number four, I'm going to have to look at my notes to make sure I'm not forgetting anything, is the field of a, a, what I call neural law. So we spoke about memories, we spoke about the body. Now let's focus specifically about, uh, about the brain in the context of identity. It turns out that our brain is us. Whatever our emotions, desires, love and hate, uh, choices, they're all in our brain somewhere. The question is, what can we do with that? So here's the answer to some of that. Right now, we know that when people do something bad, we take a trial, we look, at, we look at them, and we judge them by their actions. What if there was a way to, instead of judging them by their actions, to look at their brain and see if they had higher probabilities of doing something bad, and maybe treat their brain rather than treat the action? So imagine the following thing. Imagine that the person uh, goes to trial, and it turns out that as the trial goes by, you look at their brain, and you see that they actually had a big tumor pressing on the, on the brain, which may have led to their bad behavior. If you just take this tumor out, they're actually going to go back to good behavior. Would that not be a better idea than sending them to prison? Studies in the US show that people who go to prison 
end up being a, 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 a criminals. So if you, take a, if you take an innocent person and put them in prison, they're going to end up coming out as, as, as criminals because the experience there is pretty horrible. In the US, you can't vote after that. You can't do a lot of things. There's, you, you have a, basically a stain on your life. It's hard to get a job afterward. Everything changes. So the reality is that we take people that maybe are just there because of behavior that is not a choice, but a necessity, and we make them into criminal by choice. So instead of actually taking people and just immediately looking at their behavior, putting them in prison, we can stop right there and say, OK, a person did something bad. Let's look at their brain and see if the probabilities may have led to this behavior and if we can change them, and by doing so, make, make better people. Not sending them to prison, but sending them to some treatment that's going to help them do better. Right now, this is a pretty risky thing. When I spoke to a judge in the US, but this idea, his answer was the following. He said, maybe you're right. Maybe we can actually look at your brain and figure out what the problem is. But the reality is that you guys, neuroscientists, came to us, judges, in 1910 and told us, we now have this ability to know something about the brain by touching the surface of the skull. It's called the phrenology. And we can tell you whether a person is a criminal or not just by touching the brain. And then after 20 years, he said, actually, it's not true. This is not true. Now we have something else. Now we have EEG. This is the answer. Now with EEG, we can tell you if someone is going to be a criminal or not. And then you said all the legal systems go with EEG. And and then 1960, you said, actually, not EEG. We should go with fMRI. And now you're coming out and tell us we can actually look at the brain from the inside and tell you if a person is a criminal or not. I don't trust you guys. I need to wait a little more to know if this system is actually working. But what we could do right now is not just take people and not put them in prison or not, but we can actually use prevention to stop them in the same way we stop diseases from healthy. We can tell a guy, you know, you have a higher probability of doing something bad, cheating, taking bribes causing some harm to, uh, to pe pe people that are nearby. And if that's true, you can now at least be monitored differently. Maybe you can get a little help before that. Now we can actually go into the courthouse and help people just before they, they become criminals get, get better. Not because you're a bad person, because your brain might be not under your control in full. I'm going to finish with telling you one story of example of that that made me think about that. In the year 2010, a woman in San Diego called the police and said, my husband, who I've been married to you for 10 years now, we have a daughter who's four years old, became a pedophile. For six years, for, sorry, for 10 years, he was a great husband. Everything was perfect about this guy. And at some point, one day, he started becoming a pedophile. And I'm worried about our daughter. I don't know what to do. You've got to arrest my husband. And the police comes and arrests the guy. And he goes to court because they find child, child porn in the computer. And he goes to court. And he goes to court. And as the trial begins, he starts complaining about headaches. He said, I have headaches. And then... The doctors, the first they, they ignore that and they move on, but after a few days of, in the courthouse, he actually has a seizure. So now they rush him to the hospital where a neurologist looks at his brain and he sees a massive tumor pressing on the left side of his brain. And they say that this is impossible. They should have noticed that before, but somehow they don't know what to do. They rush him to the operating room where a surgeon removed the tumor. And the guy wakes up after one day, not only fixed without a tumor, but also no, no longer a pedophile. Now he's actually going back to his normal sexual behavior which suggests that maybe this tumor had to do with his choice. And the story actually has a second uh, twist because it becomes even more com uh, complex because uh, 10 months later, the same woman calls the police again and says, you know, my husband, who now was normal, again became a pedophile. So a second time, we've got to do something about that. So this time they say, okay, now we know that something is weird about this thing. They take him straight to the operating room, look again, and they realize that some part of the tumor wasn't taken out. There was a residue, which they take out this time. And now when he wakes up, he goes again to being with normal sexual behavior. This is like a controlled experiment. You have one thing, you behave one way. You have a different thing, you behave a different way, and so on. How many of our behaviors are controlled by our brain? I showed you that we can manipulate choice, decisions, our health. The reality is that we know more and more about what leads to our behavior just from our brain. And the more we do in that, we can actually control behavior better. We can actually give you a world that's going to go well with your choices and behaviors. And we can help you do better in your life. What I promote is understanding of the brain among people like me, neuroscientists. But also, the business world can now use that to actually create ideas products, technologies that are going to work with our biases, with our problems, and make for a better option for us. Thank you.